Uh, we're thrilled with the, uh, the attendance, to say the least, and uh, what a venue, what a view of the great uh, city of, of Boston. Uh, let me just acknowledge the presence of some very important people. We're all very important, but some very important people who stopped by this morning to show support of our guest speaker and of our program, and I'd like to thank also of the New England Council, and that is Governor Bill Weld is here. And uh, I'd like to also acknowledge the presence of the landlord here, the president of the UMass system that we all would agree is flagship uh, university and, and uh, public uh, higher ed. Uh, they keep getting accolades after accolades. It's not by accident. It's the leadership, the leadership at the top. And I think we'd all agree that uh, when they chose uh, Marty Meehan to head <coughs> the flagship <coughs> public university of Massachusetts, they have chosen wisely. So. Uh, we appreciate his support uh, of the New England Council. We appreciate his presence here today. Marty Meehan. <laughs> and Marty is also accompanied by the new uh, board uh, of trustee member here uh, at the University of Mass, who is also a UMass Amherst grad, as the former mayor of Branchy Joe Sullivan. We appreciate uh, he being here this morning and also congratulate him on his appointment. We know he will be a tremendous advocate the higher ed system here in the Commonwealth. And then finally, the person who deserves all the credit of putting together this program is Mariah Healy, who is here in the, in the back. She heads up all of our higher ed issues. <laughs> and uh, has done a wonderful job putting this program uh, together. And we also want to just congratulate her. Week after next, she'll be getting married. Uh, and uh, I've already said, take two days, you know, <laughs> no more than two, you know, don't get carried away now, you know, get, but uh, we want to congratulate her. So um, the council has uh, been very fortunate to uh, host Governor Baker on a number of occasions over the years and either to give him the annual address to our members or a special guest at our on annual celebration, we've given him the New England uh, of the Year Award, I mean, uh, on and on, but he's always, always been available, to say the least. But today, I believe, marks the uh, <clears throat> first time we're hosting him in his new role, representing the NCAA. So I want to start by thanking uh, the two sponsors of this morning's program, ACOM, the Association of Independent Colleges and Universities here in the Commonwealth, and it's led by a, a wonderful, wonderful advocate for, uh, for education here in, in the Commonwealth, and is doing just an outstanding job and uh, it's reflected by the position that he holds, and that is Rob McCarran. We want to congratulate him and thank him also. Uh, Endicott College is another of our co-sponsor, and uh, it is led by a very, very good friend, Dr. Steve DeSalvo, but he also happens to wear another hat, and that is the chair of ACOM, and he's doing, obviously, an outstanding job because whatever he takes on, he does a wonderful job, and he reflects so well not just on the college, but also on the university, I mean the university as well as the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So, but before I introduce Dr. Salvo to the podium to introduce our very special guest, I'd like to take a moment to remind you of several other New England Council event programs. Next week we'll be in New Hampshire for a very special program uh, with the Democracy Defense Project. And uh, I think you will find that very interesting and the people that we have speaking at the program. Looking forward to a Capitol Hill report programs in the next couple of weeks of Representative uh, Seth Magaziner of the 2nd Congressional District in Rhode Island, as well as Senator Susan Collins in Maine. Uh, we have a very special program here in Boston with the former United States Ambassador to Russia, <clears throat> John Sullivan, a native of South Boston, later this month. Uh, I don't know how many people have read his book, Midnight in Moscow, but it's a must read, it's a fascinating read, and uh, that will be a terrific program. This past week, we visited with Senator Sheldon Whitehouse in uh, Providence. Uh, we uh, had a breakfast just over the Hampshire House in the past week with uh, Congressman Stephen Lynch. And then yesterday, we were in Vermont uh, for Congresswoman uh, Becca Ballant. And uh, we wrap up October here again, UMass Club. We'll host a very special New England Innovates program looking at some of the incredible innovations in the robotics sector in New England. And our good friend, Congressman Jim McGovern, will deliver keynote remarks and we'll hear from many members of the New England Council. 
As always, you can find more information and register for any of these programs on our website, newenglandcouncil.com. But today, as I mentioned, we're honored to welcome back a familiar face and new role, and that is the NCAA President Charlie Baker. You know some people have to serve in as governor for some eight years, and through a, uh, a global pandemic, no less, uh, might decide to uh, take it easy and deserve to take it easy. But not, not our friend, Charlie Baker. He decided to take on a new challenge, and that is the president of the NCA during a very unusual uh, time in the organization's history, to say the least. But truly, we are grateful, grateful that he was willing to come back to tell us more about that fascinating work. So again, I thank all of you for joining us here this morning. Now I'm pleased to hand it over to the very distinguished president, Dr. Steve DeSalvo of Endicott College and chair of ACOM to introduce our very special guest, Dr. DeSalvo. It's like old times, Jim, right? Um, <clears throat> good to be here with all of you, and uh, we are delighted to be a sponsor of today's event uh, for a number of reasons. One is um, the very important fact that athletics plays a major role at every college and university, uh, particularly at Endicott. And uh, we have been blessed with uh, strong enrollments for the past five years and uh, an endowment that has doubled. Uh, but Beyond that, we look at our athletic program and we have seen tremendous growth and success there. Uh, amidst challenges in the sector uh, and certainly uh, within the confines of the NCAA rules and regs, and um, President Baker will talk about that in a minute. Uh, we're a school of 3,100 on the North Shore of Boston. Uh, we have seen our program grow tremendously uh, so much so that in the past two years, Endicott has had a Final Four hockey team, which we hosted on site. Charlie was there with me to see the games. Uh, we have had a baseball team go to the World Series uh, for the past two consecutive years. Uh, we have a top ten football team right now. Uh, and. We have had a dance team win two national championships, a women's rugby team win a national championship, uh, and a young woman in equestrian also win a national championship. That's quite an accomplishment for a relatively small institution, uh, but it speaks to the investments that we believe have to be made in athletics. I always say, hire great coaches. They will recruit and retain great players and then the institution has to invest in the infrastructure, whether that's new turf or scoreboards or locker rooms. We need to be able to do that in order to be successful. Uh, but when a third of your population plays a sport, it's important to make those investments. I'll also mention that we are Division Three. Uh, Division Three is alive and well. It is amateur athletics. We do not award athletic scholarships, and some of the things that are happening right now involve the Division I programs uh, governed by uh, presidents in Division I, but in Division III, we look at the pure amateur sports model. Our students get scholarships based on need or performance. We do not award athletic scholarships. That is the pu pure nature of Division III. Uh, it's the reason why I love it so much. Governor Baker, as governor of the Commonwealth, Republican governor in a blue state, took on some major challenges, uh, and then told me, I'm going to the NCAA. I said, oh, good, you can put your feet up and relax for a little while. <laughs> uh, we all know what's been happening with name, image, and likeness, uh, and uh, pay to play, and, and other things that are uh, forcing the conversation around what the rules and regulations should be within the NCAA. But it's incredibly important that we have somebody that understands the nature of what we're dealing with and the federal government's role, the NCAA's role, and the institution's role. So he has been a friend to many of us. Uh, we're 
very lucky to have him at the helm, and it is my honor to introduce Charlie Baker. Thanks very much, everybody. And uh, the one thing Jim didn't mention, which kind of surprised me, is uh, my first job after I got out of college was working at the New England Council, um, which I'm pretty sure makes me the only former employee who ever served as chair of the board. Um, and I'm kind of counting on you to make sure I hold on to that title for a long time. <laughs> Don't worry about it, okay. Um, and, and Steve, I would just say to you, um, you've done a wonderful job. And um, <clears throat> my wife and I have three kids who all went to school um, here in Massachusetts on the North Shore. And, um, and Steve is the only college president, to the best of my knowledge, that visited uh, the schools that they attended when they were in high school uh, personally here in Massachusetts. Um, he walks the walk, he talks the talk. Um, he is an ultimate ambassador for Endicott, and it's made an enormous difference with respect to the school. So you're a terrific administrator. As well. um, and I would say to my, my friend Marty Meehan that um, one of the things I remember saying to somebody in the media when you were originally appointed uh, by the board to be the president, um, what I thought of that choice, and I said, well, the best part is that this is the job he wants. This isn't the job he wants to get to some other job. This is the job he wants. And when you actually want the job, you do the job. And you make long-term decisions that are in the best interest of the institution. You're not just there to check a box until you can use it as the point of leverage to get whatever it is you want to do next. You wanted the job. And that's been clear by the performance of the school and by you and your team uh, for the better part now of almost 10 years, right? Thank you. Um, and to my former boss, Bill Weld, um, <laughs> I got to say, spending six years working for Bill Weld was easily the most entertaining thing I've ever done. <laughs> um, and, you know, honestly, no offense to the press, if you guys weren't here, I would tell some really cool stories about Bill Weld as well. But most of them probably aren't ready for um, public view. The, the one thing I will say, um, the biggest thing I learned from Governor Weld is you're never going to agree with everybody on, any, on everything, but you can always find things you agree with everybody on if you are willing to do the work and find those things. And that has served me and, uh, and the teams I've been on uh, since I had a chance to work with you throughout the course of my career. So thank you. Um, I'm going to give you all a little bit of a history lesson because I think uh, one of the things that's important to understand how you get to any place is, how you, is, is sort of the arc of how you got here. Um, once upon a time, the NCAA was in charge of uh, basically all the media rights for college football. And, um, and as somebody who's old enough to remember watching college football in the late 60s and 70s, I remember that experience. Um, there was a court case uh, that ultimately was, went to the Supreme Court that was decided in 1984. It was um, the NCAA versus um, the Regents, but what it really was was the NCAA versus the College Football Association, which was actually Georgia and Oklahoma. And true story. And so far true, anyway. Um, and, um, and for those of you, when I get done with this, any of you want to read the long version of this, the Athletic wrote a big piece on it this summer to sort of try to explain to people how we got to where we are in college sports these days. Um, the case went all the way through the process, and the basic argument coming from the College Football Association was we should be allowed to negotiate our own, our own deals. The NCAA's point of view was um, we negotiate on behalf of all of our members, and because we negotiate on behalf of all of our members, it's a much more even and equitable distribution, and we make sure that everybody gets an equal share, and therefore it's a more competitive system, which is better for the kids, better for the schools, better for the fans. Um, people won, people lost, all the way through the court process. It got up to the Supreme Court, um, and the Supreme Court eventually decided 7-2 that the NCA, that it was in fact a violation of 
antitrust law and that and the Sherman Act and the <coughs> schools and conferences should be able to negotiate their own football contracts and that the NCAA um, was in fact a restraint of trade on this. And um, what was interesting about the decision is the two people who wrote the dissent were Byron White, who was actually the only person on the Supreme Court who had played college football. Um, he had played at Colorado. He finished second in the Heisman Trophy ballot to um, somebody from Yale. But as a former Harvard guy, I try not to remember those names. Um, and, uh, and Justice Rehnquist. And the thrust of their decision, or their dissent, was um, they felt that the NCAA did provide a public purpose that was worth preserving because of the way they distributed the money evenly across all schools because of the fact that they were focused on the academic piece as well as on the athletic piece and they predicted that college football and college sports generally under this new model based on the Supreme Court decision was going to become all about survival of the strongest and the fittest and all about money. <laughs> and here we are. Um, it took a while to get there. There are a couple things that happened along the way I don't think people anticipated. One was ESPN, which dramatically changed the, um, the footprint and, and the role and the scale of, um, of college sports generally in, um, in U.S. society. And, and the other thing that changed was the, um, the rise of the, of the NFL, which really made football a far more visible property and a far more visible um, activity than it had been before that. Um, and as those things happened, you know, the separation that was predicted by, um, by Justices Rehnquist and White began. And you could see the spread. It was just there um, between uh, the schools that really went hard in on football and the schools that didn't. And, and as that happened, the NCAA's basic business model, which was to create competitive equity across all schools in Division I and competitive equity in all schools in Division II and Division III, strained along the way there. And, um, and as the actual act of playing college sports, football in particular, basketball, some others, started to look more and more like a business, because it was, um, that whole idea of creating sort of a competitive playing field and restraining what people could do within that competitive playing field just looked like an anachronism. And um, by the time I got approached about the job, which was literally like 60 days before I left office, um, this is not what I thought I was going to be doing. Um, Sam Kennedy from the Boston Red Sox <coughs> called me up one night and said, right around Halloween, I know that because my wife and I were sorting candy, um, said, um, geez, I just talked to the search firm that's doing the search for the next president of the NCAA. And um, as they were talking about it, I read the job description. Um, it sounded a lot like you, but I didn't want to recommend you unless um, you know, you'd be interested in it. <clears throat> and I laughed and said, Sam, I, you know, I haven't spent one day in higher education. You know, I, I'm a fan of college sports, but outside of that, you know, <clears throat> I don't consider myself to be an expert. And he said, well, I don't know, I, I read the job description, you were the first person I thought of. So would you read it? <clears throat> I said, sure. So he sent it to me, and I read it, and then I showed it to Lauren, my wife, and said, could you read this and see what you think? Because this would obviously be a bit of a disruption for her. Um, you know, she finally get me back in the house. Um, and she read it, and she looked up at me, and she said, oh, <laughs> this, this does sound a lot like you. Um, and the reason why is because the NCAA is a distributed decision-making model. It's a membership-driven institution. It has 180 committees. <coughs> Not even legislatures have 180 committees, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> and they're all particular assignments, and they're all, it's, it's, and, and that I really think was the part that made Sam think, geez, you know, somebody who's actually been in distributed decision-making 
models, who understands, you know, compromise, who gets how committee processes work, might be a good person for the job. And, and I was well aware at the time of the challenges of college sports. I also, you know, I played basketball at Harvard. Um, our two boys played football at Denison and Union, D3 schools. Um, Lauren was the best athlete in the family. She was a gymnast at Northwestern. My brother played baseball at Princeton. Um, we have tons of, tons of friends and colleagues who play college sports and whose kids play college sports. Um, I have friends who probably wouldn't have graduated from high school, much less gone to college if it wasn't for sports. Um, our kids know kids like that. Um, I really do believe it is, in some respects, one of the most important human potential development machines we have. Um, and, it, and it is completely um, American-made. There's nothing else like it anywhere else in the world. And, and that was proven at the Olympics, where you may have noticed that um, 800 uh, current and former college athletes competed for 126 countries that weren't the United States, and 600 current and former college athletes competed for the United States. Um, they won 329 medals. There were 272 of them who won. They won them on behalf of almost 30 different countries. 60% um, of the medals that were won were won by women, and 60% of the gold medals that were won were won by women. Um, college sports is uniquely American, and it's really important, and it's a powerful part of the development process for a lot of young people. Um, it teaches it teaches kids how to be teammates, which means it's not all about you. It teaches kids that success is a process, and you got to have a goal, and you got to put in the work. In many cases, it te along the way, it also teaches you about leadership and discipline, and how to get back up when you get knocked down, and how to lose with grace and win with dignity. I mean, the and I've talked to thousands of student athletes over the course of many years. And I've talked to thousands more since before I got this job and after I got it. And they are among some of the most squared away young people I ever meet. And, um, and one of the things I've tried to talk to them about is how all those things you learn playing sports can help you at work. And many of them get it just intuitively, but some of them, I, I literally say so, think you're a pretty good teammate? Yeah. What does it mean to be a good teammate? It means to understand my role, my responsibility, and how I fit into what we're trying to accomplish overall. I said, say that in a job interview. Just, have you learned, you know, success is a process about the grind and the challenge associated with getting something done? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, if I hadn't put in the work, if I hadn't worked really hard, I wouldn't have actually been able to perform. Say that in a job interview. I mean, just time and time again, you go through the things that makes somebody a great leader, a great performer, a great teammate, whatever it is, you can apply that across all kinds of settings. And, and even though I knew the NCAA had enormous problems, that was a big part of why I took the job, because I appreciate what the opportunity means. And I especially appreciate the fact that it's an enormous number of young people. It's 500,000 student athletes it's 1100 schools across three divisions and by the way division three has the most student athletes which no one ever talks about um and and yet it's a big plate of to do's when i got there and the biggest plate of to do's is probably the one that's associated with what i would refer to as you know the five percent of college sports that gets 95 percent of the attention which is big time college sports and um and it was actually right around this time last year um, that I made a proposal that I thought schools in Division I um, should be able to purchase NIL rights um, from their student athletes. Um, this was sort of an earthquake. Um, no one at the NCAA had ever suggested anything like that before. Um, but my view on it was pretty simple. The current way it was working which at that point in time, it wasn't, um, required some move that would create a more direct relationship between schools and kids when it came to NIL. Um, the 
the collective, which really has become kind of the primary vehicle through which NIL activity takes place, um, didn't exist until kind of the summer of 23. Um, and then they just sprouted up all over the place, mostly, again, at the most heavily resourced institutions. And, um, and there were no rules, no transparency, no accountability, nothing. And, um, and I started hearing about this even before I started the job in March, after it was announced in December. I just went around and started talking to kids on campuses. And one of the big things I heard is, I don't know what to believe. I don't know it's true. Nobody does. There's these people out there saying things to us about one thing or another. Um, you know, you can do this, you can do that, you can have this, you can have that. Um, nobody's writing contracts. I mean, it really was, it still is in many respects, sort of a wild west. And, um, and the only way to fix that in my mind was to create a framework to put the relationship back where I believe it belongs, which is fundamentally between the school and the student. Um, and, uh, and so during that period of time leading up to, um, leading up to where we are now, we put in place a, an injury insurance protection program that provides two years of coverage for kids across all three divisions if they get hurt playing their sport and they're still in treatment when they leave school, um, which was, my point of view, a must do. We also put in place a series of core guarantees for all kids in Division I with respect to their scholarships, um, primarily because some of the NIL stuff combined with the way we were handling scholarships before made it more tenuous and more challenging for kids to make decisions. And we also put together a series of um, initiatives and structures to start providing kids with guidance and advice around, um, around NIL. And just to give you an idea of why, why this was so important, about a third of all the kids who go into the transfer portal don't land anywhere. They literally give up a scholarship go into the transfer portal and don't land anywhere. So question number one is why? Why would they do that? And the answer is because there are a lot of grown-ups out there <coughs> making false promises to them. That's the polite word. The impolite word for a false promise is a lie. And the way it would work <coughs> is A school would be looking for, call it a linebacker. The collective and its agents would go shopping for linebackers. And they would make representation to young people at a different school that if you come to our school, there's a big opportunity. No, if you just go into the portal, there's a big opportunity. And they would collect the names, and then one would get the opportunity. And because there's no rules, and it's all going on outside the four walls of the schools, there's no regulatory structure in place for this. So part of what we put in place was a registry of trusted agents, and as much data as we could gather about how to make these decisions and a ton of video and, um, and other sort of um, assist mechanisms to help kids not end up being misled by the adults. Now, the only vehicle that was really available to us to create what I would describe as an NIL structure that makes sense through schools were some of the lawsuits, which the stack is like this high, that have been filed around some of these issues against the NCAA and the membership. And so we worked with some of the other major conferences to create a settlement with, um, with the plaintiffs in a number of these cases representing student athletes. And from my point of view, the best part about this settlement, which was just preliminarily approved by a judge in California who's been working some of these NIL issues for a long time, um, <coughs> is it puts the relationship around NIL between the school and the student athlete. 
and it establishes a framework in D1 for schools and student athletes to engage in an accountable, transparent process in which all the data and information associated with this stuff would ultimately become public and you would have something that looks like a market with real rules. Now we have a long way to, it's, all, it's just for D1, not, a, not D2 and D3, for a whole bunch of perfectly appropriate reasons. Um, but I do think it answers and solves one of the biggest questions that's been out there for a long time, which is what's the right way as this thing went from being a pastime to being a business for some schools, um, to set up the right relationship that exists between the schools and the young people. And I think this is the right answer. Um, the judge set a final decision for um, April 7th, I think, which just happens to be the last day of the men's basketball tournament. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, but that, I think, in many respects, will we'll put, um, hopefully, in place at that point in time, a structure around NIL that will be the right one for young people and the right one um, the right one for kids and the right one for schools. And it will create the transparency and the accountability around process and decisions of which we basically have very little in the current way the system works. Um, and I also think it will create, finally, um, an opportunity to give some of the kids, especially those in the, um, who play sports at that big time level, the benefits that they deserve for being able to play those sports at that level. Um, and also, the settlement does a bunch of other things. It adds 790 new scholarships to D1 sports um, and creates a whole series of mechanisms to provide a lot more public information that's currently available to people so that they can make good decisions and they're not taken advantage of. Um, there are many other issues we're dealing with at the NCAA, but that one in particular has obviously occupied a lot of my time and the time of a lot of the folks on the team. Um, I'm going to stop there, and I'm happy to take questions on, on that or other stuff. Um, help yourselves. you got potential. So <clears throat> how many of you know who Woody Woodhouse is? <laughs> All right. Woody Woodhouse um, is one of the last um, Tuskegee Airmen is still alive, which is an all-black flying unit in World War II. And he's, what is he, 96? 96. And um, there's an award named after him that I actually was <laughs> um, lucky enough to receive last week. And um, in his presentation of the award to me, he told the audience that he thought I had potential. <laughs> and, so, and so Jim came up here and said, hmm, I think you still have potential. So, <laughs> Questions for the governor, uh, Rod, Rob uh, McCarran yeah, uh, of Acom. Uh, governor, it's great to see you again. Um, and thank you for being here. And thanks, Steve and, and Jim, uh, for pulling this together. And I wanted to start with a thank you to you as governor. Um, uh, the leadership that you uh, displayed and the collaboration of your team helping colleges and universities through COVID um, was incredible. And there are schools here that are still here and thriving because of that leadership. So I wanted to say thank thanks. you for that. Um, and we've talked a lot about, or you were talking a lot about um, the focus on compensation, name, image, likeness, yep. um, the labor disputes, giving students collective bargaining and, or paying them directly. Um, and so the focus has been on compensation and, and uh, less on academics. And I guess, and, um, as Steve mentioned, Division Three is, is completely different from Division One. When you look at Division One, do you, do you see a pathway where the, there can be more of a balance between the compensation and, and academics as they go forward? Well, I mean, one of the things that most people don't talk about, and to our friends in the media, I've said this every time I've ever been in front of the media, no one's actually ever written the story, so it's still open to, to you and available to write if you wish to, which is that um, one of the great untold stories of the last 15 to 20 years in college sports has been the rising graduation rates of student athletes. And across all three divisions and every demographic, student athletes graduate at a higher rate than their non-student athlete peers. Um, and that's 
it is one heck of a story and no one ever talks about it. And, um, and one of the things we're working on because we think it's incredibly important in this new world that we work on it is, um, is creating some mechanism. Um, we're thinking about it like as sort of an academic passport, which is a vehicle to track kids from one school to another because with the transfer portal and with the opportunities to move that currently exist, there's a lot more moving around than there used to be. And, um, and the feds actually in their graduation data, if you transfer, as far as they're concerned, you didn't graduate. Um, God bless our friends in Washington on that one. Um, and so one of the things we want to do is make sure we have a mechanism in place to rig rigorously track how kids are doing on their progress to graduation, which as you know, we collect data on every single year on every single student athlete, um, and then have the ability to make sure if they transfer, you know, how much of their credits transfer, how much of their credits don't, what their plan is to actually make sure that, um, that they deal with the issues associated with lost credits and that we continue to track their graduation rates. And we're going to pay a lot of attention to that issue. But that is a terrific success story around college sports generally. And it's really important that we sustain it going forward. Questions? Just identify yourself. Uh, Sam has the, the mic. Hi, Jackie Schumann, um, Vice Chancellor Director of Athletics and Recreation at UMass Boston. Good to see you again. Um, <laughs> just along the lines of those questions, so just coming from College Athletic Leadership Symposium, a lot of ABs and, and uh, senior leaders obviously talking about everything um, you just talked about, and one of the things coming up, again, is around how do we think differently about how we invest in the human potential when we may just have somebody for a year. I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that. And, and obviously academics is an important, you know, and a critical piece of it. And we know there's a reality and, and candidly it's it's with the high revenue producing sports. You know, when we go to the Olympic sports, there will be, you know, few numbers of people in that same situation where they may be making that type of revenue. But how we continue to invest in the relationship building, the human development component when we are going to have athletes that are making hundreds of thousands of dollars and, and potentially a million dollars and, and are coming in for a year and it's a relationship business and we want to make sure we're still able to influence them and knowing that that carrot is always there. So just curious to hear your thoughts. So, you know, one of the things um, that's interesting coming out of politics is one of the questions you get asked all the time when you're in public life is, well, What's going, to, how's that, what's going to play out? How's that going to work? How's it going to play out over time? And, and this is no joke. More often than not, the answer I would give to people with that is, I don't know. And I, I would say, and I'm, the only, and I'm the only one who's giving you the honest answer, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, plenty of people have opinions, and the best part about having an opinion, more often than not in public life, is no one ever comes back and asks you a couple years later, unless you're an elected official, um, what your opinion actually was. And so people can predict all day long on everything and, uh, and never be held accountable for it. Um, I, my own view is that the current system we have with the churn, the, 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 with all of these people out there all day long just looking to get kids into the portal for no reason other than they can put them in their pocket and then figure out if there's some place they can get a fee for them if they get them to go to a, a different school is insane, okay? and. It's insane for all kinds of reasons. And part of the benefit of creating a real relationship here around NIL between the schools and the student athletes is you get the opportunity to write what I would call like a development plan. Like, okay, what is it you want to accomplish over the course of the next three years or four years or two years? That's how scholarships work. And it also, and it can be about athletics, but it can also be about academics, and it can also be about work. What do you want to do when you finish? Because let's face it, 99% of the kids, even in the most high-end programs, athletically, are not going to play professionally. You know, the number of kids from Alabama, and I've talked to Nick Saban about this, who get drafted each year is like three or four. And the number that are still in the NFL five years later are like two or three. 
And that's at like the premier football program in the country. So for the vast majority, and I mean the vast majority, like 95% plus, probably 99% plus, of the young people who play college sports, their future is going to be in something else. And right now, the schools don't really have, especially at those high ends, the ability to create a structure around how that could work. Kid doesn't work out, they can certainly go, to, go, go somewhere else. But the bottom line is, you know, under the current system, part of the reason there's so much movement and so many kids who end up nowhere is because there's no transparency, no accountability, and there is no defined process around how, how any of this works. If the settlement works, not only do we get the benefit of having, um, of having an agreement about how this will work between schools and kids, we're also going to have a, an injunction with a special master on it at the court level that's going to have a lot to say about making sure that we implement it appropriately and that we manage it appropriately. Um, and I think that will take some of the, the frenzy that's currently out there um, away. And will kids still transfer? Yes. Will kids still move from one school to another school? Maybe more than once? Probably. Will it happen less often? I think so. Um, will more kids be, um, be able to participate in NIL? Yes. Where there actually be real rules that everybody knows and understands associated with that, overseen by a court process? Yes. And that, to me, is going to do a lot to take some of the, the churn. The, the churn is being driven by the invisibility of, what, of the actors, right? The actors aren't going to be allowed to be invisible anymore if the settlement actually gets approved. And I, you know, based on the judge's decision a few weeks, a few days ago, uh, I think that's likely to happen. Um, the, the other thing I would say is I think at the end of the day, the, the freedom and the opportunity and the benefits that are associated with this agreement are the right thing to do, period. I mean, I was in the job for less than six months before I was putting something out there about school-based NIL. Um, and coming from the president of the NCAA, believe me, that was a, a shock to the system, <laughs> as they might say. Um, but, um, but I also believe that coming with those additional benefits, you need to have like a transparent and accountable structure in place, which we do not have now, so that kids can make good short-term and long-term decisions, and school schools have the ability to take back some control over how that relationship is supposed to work. Because right now, it doesn't belong to the schools. It belongs to all these third parties that are just out there doing their thing. And I think that will help a lot. We have time for one final question. Take it on this side. Dennis Leonard, distinguished well, board hi, member. Great to see you, Charlie. How's gonna, normal? Wait, wait. She's doing well. Good. Good. Wait for the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. Dennis Leonard from Everett Bank. Welcome back. We miss you, Charlie. And this is a question I think everybody's on our minds. Have you closed the door on a return to elective office? <laughs> <laughs> because in this level of divisiveness... You know, I'm not old enough to run for president. Right? <laughs> I'm only turning 68 next month, okay? Um, I think... Um, I look. I spent sixteen. No, no, I look. I spent sixteen years of my career in state government. I spent four more serving in local government, and I served on every board and commission I ever got asked to serve on um, at the state and local level. Um, I obviously care a lot about public service. Um, I think the. I think what I would say is that if someone had told me literally in October of 22, I was rolling into the end of my term when I thought I was going to be out, you know, talking to public administration programs and graduate management schools and undergraduate schools about the book that I had just written with Steve Kadish about, um, about managing the public sector. That's what I thought I was going to be doing and then maybe doing some other stuff. Um, someone had said, you know, you're going to be the president of the NCAA. I would say, yeah, sure. So, 
I never rule anything out based on the, own, the course of my own career, but, um, but I, think the, uh, I think we live in really challenging times, and it's important that really good people step up and play. Well, with that, we just want to thank the governor for not only just being here, but he's been so involved with the New England Council uh, over the years, and he's never forgotten his roots. And, uh, gave me a job. Gave me a job. Well, I, I knew. I had no skills. We knew then you had potential. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. You had potential, you know, with a lot of, you know, micromanaging. And, but it worked. It, it worked. Uh, it, it worked. And uh, we're very proud of him. He was New England of the Year. He was our chair. He was board member. Uh, his DNA is the New England Council. But not only that, what he does for charities, too, uh, you know, he, Dennis asked the question about public service. He's still interested in, give, in you know, maybe re-entering. Well, the one thing about uh, I've learned from, from our friend, the governor, is that you can give uh, and contribute without having a title. Uh, and he is so involved in the community and a lot, a lot of the worthy charities and causes that you may not be aware of unless you attend them. But that's his way of saying, I'm still giving back. It's just that I may not have the title. And that's what I admire about him, that uh, he's never forgotten uh, giving back and helping other people. And I, I think he is of the school of, you know, people like that we've always admired, Jack Connors of the world, who just say, you know what, we all can contribute in our own way. And this man here does it day in and day out. It's one of the reasons why I admire him so much. And I, obviously, I think I speak for all of you. We wish him much success, much success and his uh, initiatives that he wants to uh, achieve. But uh, uh, I can't say enough about him. So I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the conversation. And uh, I know you all feel the same way, that you want him to do well, because he reflects so well on all of us. So with that, congratulations, guys.